In my last video, I made this valve which was mechanically capable of stopping the flow of water, but the sensitive controller and other details weren't robust enough to let it run unattended. In this video, I'm going to make a few changes and hopefully turn this into a machine I can put to work. But before addressing the controller, I want to mention some mechanical modifications. First, I'm swapping out the motor with this one. Ignoring the gearboxes, my intuition says that the smaller motor should stall at a lower torque, and that'll put less stress on my plastic parts. Also, this motor has a worm drive gearbox. Worm gears are approximately impossible to backdrive, which makes them ideal for this application where I want the gate to hold its position without being powered. But most importantly, this is a weird motor that I don't have much use for outside of this particular application, and I'd like to get it out of my stockpile. Second, I'll be swapping out the standard threaded rod for this Acme threaded lead screw. This lead screw is a little harder than the threaded rod and will wear out much slower. Plus, the Acme thread is far better suited for transferring loads in this application, so I certainly won't need to worry about stripping the threads. This lead screw is going to be coupled directly to the motor's output shaft, meaning there will be no weak plastic gears in the system. The first thing I'll do is run this motor and confirm that the gears internally don't simply tear apart when I stall it. I'm only going to run this test once because it's a cheap motor and I don't want to risk stressing it more than I need to. I'll call that 50 milliamps nominal and 2 amps stall. Now for the controller electronics. I started off thinking I'd try the method I mentioned in the last video of simply putting a current sense resistor on the ground leg of the whole motor driver board. Of course, this immediately creates a potential problem where the grounds of the Arduino and motor driver are at different voltages. However, as I looked into the motor driver datasheet, I found that there's a pin specifically designated for a sense resistor. This module doesn't break out that pin for the user, but I should be able to cut a trace and solder in my own connection. With the current sense connection available, I next need to choose the value of the resistor. When picking the resistor value, I need to consider what voltage will be produced at the stall current of 2 amps and what the power dissipation requirements are. A rule of thumb I saw online is that the voltage across the sense resistor shouldn't be more than 1% of your available voltage, and the absolute max listed in the data sheet was 2.3 volts. So at 2 amps it shouldn't exceed 0.12 volts, and it must not exceed 2.3. Now all the resistors I have available are quarter watt resistors, with the lowest value being 1 ohm. We would need at least 8 of these in parallel to avoid exceeding their power rating of 2 amps. This would easily meet the 2.3 volt max, and I'm choosing to ignore that it violates the rule of thumb because 8 resistors in parallel is already feeling a little ridiculous. Here I'm throwing together the driver module, the sense resistor array, and I'm hooking up my oscilloscope. I set up the multimeter to measure the current through the motor and note that the current draw is nominal, then pull up the oscilloscope. On the scope you can see the voltage across the sense resistor. As I add resistance to the motor shaft you can see the signal increase slightly and when I completely stall the motor it climbs up to 60 millivolts. This is less than the 250 millivolts I predicted, but it also looks like the current is now maxing out at 1.2 amps rather than 2 amps. I'll attribute the lower current to the fact that we're running the motor from the driver and not the power supply directly, but that still doesn't fully account for the signal being only 60 millivolts. However, I'm not concerned about that discrepancy and 60 millivolts is plenty strong enough of a signal to move forward with. If I needed to, I could probably feed this signal directly into the Arduino, but I believe some amplification and filtering may be beneficial. In this FFT, you can see there are components of the signal as low as 80 Hz. Filtering this out could be done with code, but I'd rather keep the code simple for this project and instead use an analog filter. Additionally, I'd like to amplify this 60 millivolt signal to use the full 5 volt range of the Arduino's ADC. It's definitely overkill for this application, but I'm going to use TI's filter design tool. In the filter design tool, I start by picking the type that I want, which is a low pass. For the gain, I want to amplify the 60 millivolt signal by about 75 times to make use of most of the 5 volt range of the Arduino ADC. I'll specify something fairly low for the passband, keeping in mind 80 Hz was the lowest component I know I need to remove. A fourth order filter will require two op amps, and I know I'll be using a chip with two circuits. Butterworths and bezels are pretty similar. You can see how the Butterworth is going to attenuate 
the higher signals better than the bezel. This gives you a preview of the topology. When choosing the topology, the tool gives you a few notes, and the most important one for me is this inverting versus non-inverting gain. I don't have a negative supply rail or a virtual ground, so I need to select the non-inverting gain topology. The tool allows you to select what resistor and capacitor series you're using, which will constrain the values to nice round numbers you can expect to have in stock. I'll use my 1% resistors and 20% capacitors. It has resistor values in here that I know I don't have even with my 1% kit, so I'm going to switch this to the 5% resistor kit. And now it's picking resistor values that I do know that I have. An interesting feature of this tool is that you can see the range of possible responses you can get based on the tolerances of the components you've chosen. The ideal response is along the red line, but I can expect a response anywhere within this region once it's built. There's a lot more info this tool gives you, and I highly recommend it if you're designing a filter. And here's my implementation of that circuit. I changed the capacitor values significantly lower because I didn't have the correct ones available, and I reduced the gain from 75 down to around 52 when I discovered that my op amp only outputs 3.5 volts, not the full rail to rail 5 volts I was expecting. I'm generating a 1 Hz sawtooth wave to show the gain of the circuit. The input voltage ranges from about 0 to about 60 millivolts to simulate the current sense resistor. Now when I switch to a frequency sweep, you can see the gain quickly start dropping. By around 60 Hz, there's no gain at all and it begins attenuating. And now I've connected the signal conditioning to the current sense resistor and I see the signal rise all the way up to 3.5 volts. I believe it may be maxing out the op amp, but it hits that limit very close to when the motor actually stalls, so this will work just fine. The output range is much better than the couple dozen millivolts I was seeing on the first iteration of this valve. With the new electronics showing promise, it's time to hop into SolidWorks and redesign some parts. I'm keeping the old body, but the entire top assembly will be redesigned and the gate will get some modifications. I toss in models of the motor and the shaft coupler to see how I want them positioned, first trying to line it up with the pipe, but then deciding to turn it perpendicular for better access to the screws. The new top assembly will have two main parts, the cover flange type piece, which receives all the bolts and forms the seal, and then the motor mount that positions the motor and is secured with only four of the screws. The mount has a thin platform to screw the motor onto, and the band over the top will hold the motor down as the gate closes and pushes the motor up. Finally, I modify the gate to accept a brass nut. With the new parts printed, I will begin the assembly. After taking apart the old assembly, I start by putting the new motor on its mount. Then I put the shaft coupler on. I put the lead screw on and test fit it with the cover. Screw on the brass nut. And the whole thing gets bolted together. Now we get to see it run for the first time. The old design needed a full minute to open or close, and it seemed like it would destroy itself if I allowed it to stall. This video is running in real time, so you can see it operates much faster, and it doesn't feel like it'll tear itself apart when it reaches the limit of travel. Here the Arduino has been hooked up and it's able to automatically close or open the valve in response to a button press. The algorithm hasn't been changed significantly from the last video. It's still just running until a threshold is reached, but the threshold value is much less sensitive with the new circuitry. The number shown in the serial terminal is the ADC value, and throughout the course of the day, the idle value of the ADC seemed to drift by about 10 counts, but the threshold value is now well above that drift. One important addition I made is a timeout feature. If the Arduino doesn't detect that the valve is open or closed within 10 seconds, it will turn off the motor and just give up. This is important because the code to actuate the valve is blocking, meaning it's unable to control the pump or respond to anything else while the valve is actuating. Without a timeout, a failure in the valve could result in the tubs either overflowing or just totally drying out. Now we're outside and I've installed everything and got it running. In the cabinet you'll find a mess of wires and the new circuitry. 
it's been over a week since the last video. The hot glue holding the modules onto their DIN rail clips held up for some of them, but it's coming loose on the relay board. The valve is currently being controlled automatically in response to the float switches, but I can always open or close it manually from here. You can see the valve leaks significantly during the opening and closing process as the water escapes along the lead screw. It also still leaks a small amount through the porosity in the print and the pipe connections. I dealt with all the leaks by simply having it located above the tub. In this clip, I have the grow beds and the valve both visible so you can see how the pump and valve operate in sync. The grow beds are currently draining, and once empty, the pump turns on and the valve closes. Once full, the pump turns off and the valve opens. You might notice the green pole in the grow bed is different than the PVC pipe in the last video. That's the water level sensor with two float switches. Previously, there was a single magnet that traveled inside the tube, activating reed switches epoxy to the outside but now it's two independent float switches clamped onto that pole. A complete fill and drain cycle takes about three and a half minutes. I plan to research more about the ideal cycle timings and add any delays where needed. Until then, the frequent cycles will help highlight any weak points in the design. For example, after filming this clip, the valve eventually failed to close. I don't know why it failed to close, perhaps the inrush current period was longer than usual, but with the valve stuck open, the pump can't fill the tub and the system was stuck in that state. I addressed that by changing the code so the valve would be allowed to retry opening or closing after a 30 second timeout period. Finally, the last clip of the video is a close up of a few opening and closing cycles. You can see I gave the valve some paint. If I'm being honest, I'm not really sure what the paint is for. I think I'm hoping that it keeps the heat and UV light from damaging the plastic over time. It also helps control the water leaking through the layer lines, but not perfectly and I don't count on that lasting. After recording this, I made the vertical end of the pipe extend down into the water to prevent splashing. I don't see significant splashing from the water that leaks off the valve, so I think the only water losses from this system will be evaporation and plant transpiration. That's it for this video. If there's a third video in this series, it'll likely involve connecting the system to my website so I can do remote health checks and receive texts when the water is low. It's currently winter, so I'm going to leave this running as a test until I can plant something in the spring. Leave a comment if you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.